Good evening from the, from the plague capital of the United States. I greet you all. Uh, it's a pleasure to see you all out here. I'm sure you all, like me, were neurotically washing your hands until a few seconds before walking in here. I know I was, so it's a pleasure to see you all. Uh, as was said in the introduction, uh, I am an economist, and when I tell people that uh, at cocktail parties and on planes and stuff, uh, people usually say, ah, economics, hmm. the dismal science. And I always say, well, you're half right. It's not really a science, it's just kind of a dismal area. We do our best. It's a pleasure to see you all tonight. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, big tech, as we say, uh, Silicon Valley and the uh, technology platforms. And it's kind of interesting, you know, because we all depend so much uh, on these platforms and the legitimately useful services that they provide, Google, Amazon, and others. Uh, those services are very handy. But the thing that we notice uh, the most about the giant firms we have today of big tech is that they tend to be characterized by what we economists call network effects. Now in economics, uh, if you take basic econ at the high school level, uh, we tend to treat markets and industries in the economy like they're all the same. So we'll talk about supply and demand, and we reach some pleasant equilibrium where everyone is satisfied. And the tendency is to treat markets like they're all essentially the same. But what happens if you really look at modern industries and their unique characteristics, you see they have a lot of unique characteristics. I mean, after all, we produce so many different goods and services, you know, shoes and sandwiches and cars and smartphone chips and back rubs and Hollywood movies. All of these are market goods and services. Well, they're so different. Why would the markets themselves all be the same? And in fact, they have a lot of different characteristics. So these big tech markets tend to be driven by a very conventionally recognized economic phenomenon that we call network effects, right? And network effects occur when the value to you of a service increases as more people use it, okay? So like if you buy a pair of sneakers, if you buy a pair of Adidas running shoes, they have a certain usefulness to you. Well, if I buy myself and my own pair of Adidas sneakers, yours don't become any more useful to you. They're just unrelated facts, right? On the other hand, if you are on a social media network like Facebook or YouTube or Instagram, you're on there, and then I join that network, the network becomes slightly more valuable to you because there's one more party, one more person with whom you might connect or interface with or share your own content with. That's the weird feature of network-mediated markets where a lot of the value comes from connecting with another user. As more users join a network, it gains value, and that has a number of major ramifications for how the markets behave. So social media is a good example. YouTube is also useful. If you have video of some important development in the world that you want to share and get people to see and think about and act upon, what are you going to do? You want to share it on the video sharing network that has the greatest audience, that is the greatest number of users. And of course, in reality, that's going to be YouTube. And look, I love Vimeo as much as the next guy, but it's not where you're going to put your video if your priority is to get it in front of the biggest possible audience. You'll use Google's YouTube. That's a manifestation of that network effect. That network, that YouTube uh, network is so useful to you, not because you love the platform particularly, but because of the giant audience that's there. And that giant audience attracts more video creators, as we said, and the presence of all those creators makes it more magnetic to more users. Just like Facebook or social media, as more people join it, it becomes more useful to you as someone who has posts or content to share, and so it becomes more magnetically attractive to other content creators and social media profile developers. It's that positive uh, reinforcement, that self-reinforcing effect that is what network effects is all about. And I have to tell you, uh, if you look at the histories of today's social media and today's big tech companies in general, Many of them, their founders were aware of network effects and their economic ramifications when they created them. And they recognized if we get a lead over our competitors, 
early in the history of our industry, we can become completely dominant because people are magnetically, gravitationally almost attracted to this uh, particular platform because it has the most users. So in network effect mediated industries, early leaders, early incumbents in markets are especially likely to build up a lead and to become maybe a monopolist or at the least an oligopolist, right? So in economics, we use the word oligopoly to describe markets that have not quite a monopoly. There's not just one single dominant firm that controls the industry, but maybe two or three, some small number. So those of you who have smartphone uh, smartphones on your person right now, which I'm guessing is 100% of you, they're going to be running operating system software that makes the phone work. It's going to be made by Apple through its iOS operating system software, or Google through its Android uh, OS. Those are the two. <laughs> It's a small number of firms, you know. These are network, man, uh, network effect manifestations. It means these markets are more prone than other markets within the capitalist economy to become monopolized. Now, of course, in the rest of the economy, we definitely have monopoly. You know, in the early days before we had any anti-monopoly laws, we had monopolies in oil, <laughs> something as important as oil, through Rockefeller's old standard oil monopoly, you know and in steel, and in tobacco, for you smokers, the American Tobacco Company. Now in the 1910s, it became sort of illegal to have these monopolies, at least for a time. These days, monopolies are only partially illegal. It sort of depends on how you get them, you know. But that's the big feature of these uh, network-mediated markets. And we can see that in any of these uh, modern firms, but maybe the clearest way to see it is just to recognize that right now, the five biggest corporations in the world are American tech platform corporations. So there's many ways to rank companies by size, of course. The most conventional way is through what they call market cap, the market capitalization of a company. It's where you take all the stock in a company, the pieces of ownership in a, a corporation that you can buy, and we multiply the number of shares by the price of the shares. So you can get a hypothetical cost that you, would be, that you would have to pay to buy the entire company. It's a broad measure of value, and there's other ways to gauge firms like revenue size and others. But market capitalization is pretty common. Well, right now, the five biggest firms in the world by market capitalization are tech platform companies. As I recall from memory right now, the five biggest firms are Apple, Microsoft, Google, Amazon, and Facebook. <laughs> Those are the five biggest. Now, right now, we have Saudi uh, Aramco, the former Arab American oil company, which Saudi Arabia floated a portion of through a hilariously corrupt and cronyism-ridden process where the current uh, prince of Saudi Arabia twisted the arms of his uh, royal family members to push up the value. Many in the business press don't take that number quite seriously because of how manipulated the process was. So putting that aside, those are the five biggest firms, and they're all tech platforms. I just want to remind you all, it's incredibly uncommon historically for the five biggest firms in the world to be uh, like all from one industry or one sector of the economy. When I was a younger person some time ago, the biggest firms would be, you know, Exxon, Walmart, Chase Bank, Berkshire Hathaway, a couple of others. Now it's just these straight five tech platform giants are the biggest. That speaks to the real ramifications of network effects. These companies are so prone to monopoly, they dominate the list of biggest firms. Very unusual historically, and that's sort of a manifestation of that. So we can look at any of these firms and their unique features, and there's a lot to say about them. In the book, I have a chapter for each one of these big five giants because they all have a, a fascinatingly sleazy history of absorbing and crushing competitors and bullying tyrant CEOs and so on. But I like to start with the ones that people sort of see as the nice exceptions to mean capitalism, you know. So I look at firms like Google for example, because Google has such a sweet reputation relative to other blue chip Fortune 500 firms, you know. So Google's famous for providing all these extremely useful services like online search, online video, the large majority of the world's smartphones run on its Android software, and all these other useful functions like Google Drive, it's a long list, you know. And those services are provided for free. And the firm's also famous for very uh, generous employee benefits, you know, high pay, 
uh, lots of workplace amenities and so on, arguably free time off through their 20% principle, which actually doesn't hold up if you look into it. But the point is they have a very favorable reputation compared to you know, Exxon and Walmart and the usual uh, old economy capitalist uh, suspects. But if you look at Google, the history is uh, very interesting. So one, of, one feature we should start with is that you might wonder, okay, I've been talking about network effects and the book explores that, why, like what connection does Google have to network effects? If I search for something on Google, that doesn't make Google more useful to you, does it? But of course it does, right? The nature of uh, web search is it's algorithm driven, right? If you look at the early days of the World Wide Web, I'm old enough to have been a web user back in the 1990s. And that was when the web was first taking off. At first, of course, it was developed by military and university sources who have the stable funding environment and long-term priorities to fund something as pie in the sky is useful web search. But as the web grew, it became more and more important for even civilian users, right? And so YouTube searches, you notice they are like fairly successful if you're interested in something, the right number of keywords, you can usually find what you want. Well, it's a manifestation of the network effect. You may not like to hear this, but I have to tell you, Every search that you have ever entered into the, YouTube, into the uh, Google search field is recorded by the firm. Every search you've ever done, and that everyone does, is recorded, but not just that. Like, we talk about data-driven industries these days. It's important to reflect on what that means for something that we normal people use all the time, like Google search. Anytime you use Google search, they don't merely record who you are and your web address location and what you entered into the search field. They also record how long you waited before clicking on one of the search results. They look at which search result you clicked on and also whether you were happy with that search result, which they call the long click, where you click on something and don't come back, which suggests you were pretty happy with the results of that search? Or did you come back quickly and go, no, that's not what I wanted, I had a different thing in mind, and you click on something else, which says to them the search needs refining. So as every one of us over the last uh, 22 years since the firm was founded in 1998, every search you've ever entered into Google is useful data for them that they use to refine their various search algorithms. What that means though, is that the more of us who use that search function, for example, the more, the more valuable it becomes to the rest of us users as that algorithm gets further refined. So Google search really is a manifestation of that network effect. My use of it makes it a little bit more valuable to you, you know. And as a result, we have an environment today where Google search, just as an example, is extremely dominant and that includes even on, it's certainly Google, uh, dominant on the mobile platforms because of course most phones run Android software which Google owns and defaults to Google search uh, whenever you want to search for something and gives them a lot more useful data. The main holdout, really the only uh, opposition to Google's search dominance, of course, is Bing. And some of you will be familiar with Bing if you use a Microsoft Windows operated computer in your work uh, place or maybe in your uh, home computing environment and you click on something that involves an online search, it will default to Bing. Very few people uh, choose Bing otherwise. And Google is so dominant that indeed the word now is synonymous with search, you know. Yeah, I know that, I Googled it. When your name becomes synonymous with the industry, that's how you know you dominate it. And because of that, we can look at the ramifications of that network effect in search. And indeed, it's been enough to re reduce web search, which is a very, very important market segment. I mean, think how often you turn to that. I probably do Google searches a couple times a day because there's so many things we want to learn about on the web, and the web is so vast. In the, again, back in the 90s, you didn't have Google. You turned to you know, Alta Vista or Yahoo Search or Web Crawler, and God bless them, but they were based on just simple keywords. You know, you type this word in, well, here's a website that has that word in it. It's a pretty crude search method, especially because as time went on, website operators and developers recognized that you could draw more search traffic if you just took the bottom of your website and just stuffed it to kingdom come with not very relevant search items, you know, celebrity nudity, David Letterman show, nothing related to your site, but just anything that would attract more search traffic. So Google's much more sophisticated algorithm was very welcome. And the basic way it operates, of course, is through 
basically a technique borrowed actually from academia. So when you're a fancy professor like me, you uh, gauge the value or maybe the relevance of a academic article by how many other articles refer to it, like how often it's cited, and we have citation, uh, citation indexes and such that let us keep track of that. Google used that basic premise for its web search uh, algorithm development. We decide how high to rank a particular website in your web search based on how many other websites refer to it. Okay? That's a much less gameable method of uh, operating web search and it brought Google a lot of success. And of course, like most of the big tech firms who now have billionaire owners and are, again, among the five biggest firms in the world, their big justification for themselves is, yes, we're super rich and super powerful and you rely on us constantly through your cell phone, but we earned that because we developed this software technology through our own work and our own smartness. And so we have this sort of cult of Steve Jobs and uh, Jeff Bezos-like figures who bring this technology to us. But as I look at uh, in the book, if you look at the, the history of it, you'll discover very quickly that the large majority of the technology used in this mobile and online te uh, these mobile and online platforms. It comes from publicly funded research. And Google's a great case, you know. Again, Google, which you know, has such a positive reputation, these free services, it's a good example for us to look at. Well, you might know, some of you, Google's original web address that you used to reach it was not originally google.com as it is today. Originally, it was google.stanford.edu because that was the who cares about money, let's do long-term research, campus research environment that is perfect for developing something like Google where you're figuring out a new technology and you're not gonna be able to do that if you're focused on making some near-term uh, Wall Street stock price target that's gonna constrain your ability to focus on research and make you focus on monetizing the technology. So Google has that sort of background which let them build up this Again, very useful technology, but of course, as we know now, these firms are so dominant, and again, it's not just that they're the five biggest firms, I mean, I can say that, but each of us, I think, knows just from our life experience how much we count on these firms for our modern lives. You look at your phone and you Google something, or you're watching it on YouTube, you use the phone's operating system to pull up useful apps or to order things on Amazon or to look at Facebook or Instagram. We're all pulling on these firms all the time. What that means though is that our reliance on them represents a certain level of importance on their part or we could say a certain amount of power. If those firms went away, we would, I think, desperately miss them. And as I say, of course, like I use these firms' services all the time, so I would agree with that. I would hate for these firms to just dematerialize tomorrow and not be available. The services are legitimately useful. And I feel like sometimes people on the left want to, you know, maybe for legit reasons, boycott use of these technologies because of their ugly election interference or their heavy lobbying spending and their various other icky characteristics. I think the services are useful, it's just the firms providing them that are problematic, as is so often the case with capitalism. But uh, the example of Google is good because we use them for so many purposes. And in particular, Google's been interested in how we use their search engine for shopping online. And of course, Amazon, which we'll get to in a moment, is extremely dominant in online or e-commerce. They uh, earn over 50 cents of every dollar spent on online commerce. But Google is their main existing competitor because many people use Google to initiate searches for you know, different products or services, a computer they wanna buy, a hotel room, a flight they wanna take. Google's very e eager to make those searches easy for us. So it's relevant, you know, when we look at their history. And by now, even the mainstream commercial press, like the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal, who themselves make their money from selling advertising to large firms that can pay, and so they tend not to want to antagonize big business too much, even they are now recognizing the incredible uh, influence that these firms have. So Google again, uh, there was a long period of time where if you went and searched for a product on Google, you would get at the top of your search results different online platforms that themselves offer online shopping resources. And there's a number of these and very few of them are known now because the history of it, as we can just again see through very typical commercial press histories, Google would put these firms high on their search results based on the algorithm, ranking them on their relevance, and so they would do well. Then Google would recognize that they were losing search, like commercial product shopping, 
search traffic to these platforms, and abruptly, like overnight, these other competing commercial uh, search platforms would go from being on the first page of Google's search results to like page five or page six or lower. And I mean, don't take my word for it, any business owner will tell you today that getting relegated beyond, like below the first page of Google's reported search results is largely enough to kill that business as far as its online relevance is concerned. I mean, just think about it. Many of us have done just quick and easy, not thinking too much about it, online search for a product or a service or something. And you look at the first couple search results and that basically defines the realm of your, of your search. I'm not saying we're being lazy or lame for that. We're human beings. We have finite lifespans and busy days. We're trying to get through this as quickly as possible. But once Google recognizes another firm is doing that, they will very quickly downrank it. And so, for example, uh, at one point, uh, Google sources have reported that when uh, uh, the platform became sort of annoyed that another firm was sucking up its uh, commercial search traffic. We have the example of Larry Page, who was one of the co-originators of the Google software in the first place, along with Sergey Brin, the other famous Google co-founder. Uh, they reported that Larry thought product should get more exposure. Product, of course, refers to Google's own search products in this case. And what they're saying is we should uprank our own Google search results for whatever it is you're interested in for buying. And we're gonna downrank those competing search platforms that do product. Now that's an example that comes out of business. Like that's Google using its dominance, its semi-monopoly in search to spread that to other fields. Uh, but we should recognize like that is something that's very common for monopolists to do, try to use their existing monopoly to t monopolize and take over other markets. That's how Microsoft first got in trouble by tra trying to take over uh, the web browser industry. But that speaks to how important these firms are and how much we rely on them. That's kind of interesting. But uh, maybe the juiciest thing that Google is involved in, just to uh, mention this because everyone's always interested in this, uh, Google, for all of its beautiful high ideals, and the point of this, of this isn't that we shouldn't have ideals or hold people to them. My point is these guys are monopolists and they aren't gonna stick by the ideals they say they have. So a classic case here was Google and Apple's somewhat famous wage-fixing conspiracy. Now, I don't use the word conspiracy lightly. You know, these days when you say the word conspiracy, people think of Alex Jones and figures like that who say that 9-11 you know, wasn't really terrorism, it was the government. Dick Cheney flew those planes into the World Trade Center. There never was a World Trade Center. Like goofy, not evidence-based, huge claims that are sort of paranoid sounding. That's what we say these days when we uh, use the term conspiracy theory. Well, this conspiracy is what we call legally adjudicated. So this was a criminal court case in the course of which we had the discovery process, right? If you watch uh, law shows on TV, your law and order and so on, you know that when there's a court case, both sides' attorneys get to look at the confidential documents or relevant evidence on both sides. And so that's ex very exciting for people like me. Usually corporate you know, legal cases don't go all the way to trial. They get settled at one point or another because companies don't want their information to enter the public record. So when they occasionally do, like in this case, people like me who research these guys get very excited because, oh boy, we're gonna get a bunch of their dirty laundry that they email to each other and see what really goes on. And that certainly happened in this case. So if you're not familiar, uh, this is a big uh, case about some corporate practices from the period roughly from 2005 through, through, through uh, 2010. And this was a period when, the firm, when these online tech platforms were growing very, very quickly and becoming the giant firms they are today. Google was growing, was growing quickly at this time and so was the brand new one, which was Facebook at that point. And so it was very difficult if you were a Silicon Valley tech platform to hire out the, uh, uh, the coders, the software code writers and platform designers who we all know have the you know, fancy jobs of today and who you need if you're gonna gradually build out a tech platform that's going to have literally billions of users as these platforms do. So it was a, you know, a seller's market as they say. If you, were, if you had a, uh, a background in uh, software writing and coding, you could uh, command a pretty high price. So what's interesting is at this time, a number of big tech and Silicon Valley uh, companies entered into a, again, legally, adju legally adjudicated, you don't have to take my word for it, it was settled in court using evidence based on their documents, a legal conspiracy. They, ille they illegally worked together 
to lower the prices, lower the salaries of the tech coders that they hired using a no poaching agreement, which is completely illegal. That's a wage fixing scheme, as they call it legally. But it's very interesting. The big players at that time uh, were Google, which was one of the quickly growing new firms, as well as Apple's then CEO, you know, the late Steve Jobs. Back then, Apple, even then, was far larger than these other firms, so it had the most muscle. And it appears, from what we know from the limited uh, record that went through discovery, it looks like the, Steve Jobs was the sort of instigator of this. But what it came down to was Google and uh, Apple and a number of other big uh, software-relevant hiring firms. Uh, so Pixar was one. As I recall, Oracle was involved and several others. I look at the details in the book. But they agreed on a no-poaching agreement. So I might be desperate, being Google uh, or Apple, to hire more software writers. It's very difficult to find these people, and they want giant six-figure salaries and nice health insurance. How dare they? So what we will do is you and me, CEOs, will agree between us, secretly, because this is a white-collar crime, will agree not to poach each other's software coders, right? I'm not going to cold call one of your software writers and try to poach them, try to hire them for my company, if you'll agree not to do the same to me. Again, this is a price-fixing deal, a wage-fixing deal in this case, which is not compatible with even America's loosely enforced antitrust laws. It's very interesting because it all came out in court. We have the record of it. So, for example, we have an email from Steve Jobs, who people still like cite as this in, uh, inspiring visionary tech leader who created these beautiful uh, modern uh, Mac computers and our slick iPhone. Even though if you look at the record, it's mostly his engineers who are doing it and trying to ignore his dumb objections. It's kind of an interesting history, I'll spare you. Uh, but Jobs said uh, to Google's CEO at that time, who's Eric Schmidt, I said to them, if you hire a single one of these people, that means war. Now again, if I said that to you, who cares? I'm just some idiot on the street. But if you're Apple, if you're even then one of the biggest corporations on the surface of God's earth, you're going to take a threat like that at least somewhat seriously. you know. And certainly if you're a somewhat vulnerable, relatively new firm like Google, who relies in part for their search user traffic on mobile phones, and at that time, uh, iPhone was the by far dominant smartphone. A threat from Steve Jobs is a major, major event, you know. So Jobs made that threat, but what we discover is that Google's own management then agreed. And they said, all right, we won't poach from you if you don't poach from us. And by now, because of that discovery process that goes through court, we now have uh, Google's own human resources hiring documents that indicate that uh, Apple had sp or Google had special agreements with certain companies like Apple and others and put them on what they called restricted hiring lists, which meant that the, you shouldn't, your HR people shouldn't cold call their staffers and try to hire them over and try to hire them over to your firm. And those do not cold call lists include, yeah, Apple, uh, Google, as well as others like Microsoft, Intel, IBM, and even Comcast, you know, the uh, cable and broadband company. But Apple agreed. It's a picture of powerful private sector figures working together to be sneaky, sleazy scumbags. And so Apple has an internal email, which we can now read, thanks to the court process that said, we're, uh, they wrote to their HR uh, managers and said, please add Google to your hands-off list. We recently agreed not to recruit from one another. So if you hear of any recruiting they're doing against us, please be sure to let me know. And within Google, when their CEO, Eric Schmidt, would internally communicate with his HR people about this, the subject would be, do not forward, like in all caps, which is, of course, online for I'm serious about this, right? Do not forward. And actually, in the body of the emails themselves, we can read, uh, that Schmidt referred to trying to bring more software-heavy firms into this circle of illegal wage fixing by not poaching, so offering these workers less in order to make it easier to hire them and less costly. And he tried to bring in new firms like eBay into their circle. And in one of Schmidt's emails to his HR people, he even says that he would prefer that communication about this be done, in quoting, verbally since I don't want to create a paper trail over which we can be sued later. And his HR head, in her reply, said, make sense to do orally, I agree. 
they're not idiots. Like, they know that this will make a paper trail. I mean, these days we call it a digital trail, but it still holds up just as well in court, you know. And that's exactly what happened. It was the presence of this record, like in a lot of price-fixing schemes that we see in oligopoly. It was that presence of that record that led to these firms being convicted and being forced to make a settlement with a class action suit brought against them by their software coders. Now, obviously, these workers are not exactly working in the mines of South America that let us have the lithium that runs the battery for these firms and the tin that we use to solder all these circuits together, but they are working people. You know, they are not CEOs and billionaires in today's ruling class, so they may be white collar, but many of us would still say they're still workers. And this is a, again, legally adjudicated corporate conspiracy to lower the compensation these people uh, received. And my favorite part of this episode, and I'll shut up about it, was at one point a, uh, was, yes, a Google recruiter, so a Google HR person, who for one reason or another didn't get this message or didn't realize how serious it was. And this particular Google recruiter did cold call an Apple staffer, one of their software writers, and uh, tried to recruit them to work for Google. Well, once Steve Jobs heard about this, he wrote a very pissy email to Eric Schmidt at Google and asked him if their agreement was still valid. Uh, and Eric Schmidt, who to this day, you know, from his Google heritage, likes to say that he's very principled and we believe in a good monopolistic corporation and we're not evil. He wrote back to Steve Jobs' complaint and said, and I quote, that this worker would be fired within the hour. And Steve Jobs replied with a smiley face, you know, with a colon and a closed parenthesis to indicate a fun smiley face. <laughs> it's fun, isn't it? when we do that. So that's kind of a particularly hideous Silicon Valley version of wage, wage fixing and market power mongering. But the point is, these giant companies, their status comes from the unique aspects of network effects, very different source of monopoly power from, you know, John Rockefeller's Standard Oil monopoly of yesteryear and AT&T's telecom monopoly, but it comes from different forces, but it still has that same outcome, which is giant extremely powerful corporations stomping on the working man or woman with you know different circumstances depending on the industry but it's incredible you know it's a very different technology a different technological level and a very different era that we're living in and yet the economics of it is fairly consistent and so we see pretty consistent results even for companies like Google which have about as immaculate a reputation as any kind of fortune 500 firm could hope for you know so that's interesting Apple itself is kind of fascinating. Uh, it also has a very idealistic feel. If you personally stroll into a uh, Apple retail store, if you go to your mall or local Apple store, of course it's very pretty and obviously tech forward and minimalistic, but if you talk to the fairly modestly paid kid retail workers working there, they really will express to you, and I think it's very real, like they have a sort of idealism to them. Yes, anyone can sell shoes or sandwiches. We work for Apple, and we sell these smartphone platforms that connect people and give you so much value, and many of these apps are free, like YouTube and Google and so on. So, you know, we're providing something better here, but if you look at the record, uh, Apple's uh, history is pretty heinous. Of course, Apple originated the modern iPhone in 2007. It took a few years for Google to create a, the Android operating system that powers its competitors from Samsung and then down the economic scale there. But all of today's modern smartphone side effects from you know, people are very concerned these days about how much they're using their phones and how they're not engaging with their friends and loved ones when they get together. Very reasonable point. The thing that strikes me, of course, the most is that these days, like kids, like little kids have tablets and phones now. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I, when I was a young person, I found talking to people and socially interfacing and flirting to be rather challenging. If I had had a tablet when I was a little kid, I would be an illiterate, penniless virgin today. But look, thank God we didn't. But today's kids, I think they have tablets, like small children with tablets. And frankly, people very quickly tend to go, oh, the parents. How dare those terrible parents give those slick technologies to those children? I mean, there's a point there, but my tendency is to be very sympathetic to parents. I mean, if you've ever raised a kid, or even if you're just like me, if you're some childless scumbag who has a nephew or a niece who you occasionally babysit to give your, you know, your brother or sister a break occasionally so they can go on a date night and get away from their kids for a minute, 
Babysitting kids is the most exhausting work I've ever engaged in. I babysit it, babysat for my nephew and niece back when they were little kids, like for a couple hours. At the end, I was crying blood. I was so exhausted. Little kids are so high energy, and they're so interested in things, and they never want to leave you alone. You can totally understand why in my generation, my parents turned on the TV. These days, you give your kid a tablet or maybe a smartphone, you know, and you let them play with that, maybe with parental controls of some sort on, perhaps not. But all of this technology, of course, originates with Apple, which had that original vision of creating this very slick, visually mediated mobile operating system that lets you open so many apps. So Apple phones themselves are a platform, much like YouTube and Facebook are. Their main value is bringing together different users and exploiting the value that comes from that. So it's interesting. And Apple has sort of engaged with uh, people like uh, even their major investors, like Janus Partners, that uh, large investment fund that's brought up the fact that uh, users these days are increasingly recognizing how perhaps not addicted we are to our mobile devices, but extremely incredibly attached to them at least. Maybe we could still say addicted. Like they at least are recognizing that that's something they unleashed on the world. But of course we've seen that they do have this history with other firms like Google of not being above using wage fixing conspiracies to control markets that they interface with. Uh, and also all interesting uh, for uh, Apple's iPhones is the App Store, you know. So Apple uh, is famous historically for building platforms that are what we call closed. So if you used an old uh, Apple Macintosh computer, you could only use certain apps that were written specifically for Macintosh computers. And if you're like me and you grew up in a household of people who are you know, art designers and stuff, and you had Apple computers around, you would kind of a limited suite of applications because they only accepted ones that were ported specifically for their uh, operating system and were very picky about it. This is why Microsoft is still much more dominant than Apple is on uh, PC computers because they didn't create a closed platform. Anyone can write a program, you know, a software program to run on Windows like a, you know, a video game or a, a productivity software program like an Excel or something like that. Uh, but that history means that they have a uh, very tight control to this day. So if you, like me, have an iPhone, you can go to the App Store and buy different apps that Apple didn't make. So it's not a completely closed platform, you know, you can use uh, applications made by other developers. But Apple is famous. If you read the business press, it's discussed frequently because of how much money is at stake. They're famous for having very tight control over the inventory of applications that appears in the App Store. And they have a whole very opaque process for poor software writers who want to get their game or software in front of different users. They have dozens of criteria that they say explicitly, and they have other criteria which they, are very, which they will say they keep secret. There are reasons that we may turn down your app to appear in our App Store that is used by millions of iPhone users, and we may not tell you why. Maybe we just don't like it. Maybe it competes with something we're thinking of developing. Maybe we're going to steal your idea and make our own native application. That's popular. Uh, it's unclear. So that company, even though it only makes, you know, we, know it's, we associate it with making hardware, Apple, you know, smartphones and tablets and desktop computers, unlike Google and Facebook, which are purely immaterial software online firms, they still have platform economics at play. And ask your friends here in Seattle who create uh, online software, they'll tell you that Apple has a fairly uh, tight grip that they keep on the App Store. So they, they play a role in this process as well. But uh, also, I definitely want to at least make sure, this being Seattle and all, that we mention one of our other uh, native tech uh, platform monopolists. And of course, that one would rhyme with Shmamazon. Uh, you guys, may, you may have heard of Amazon, the firm. And again, let me just say right now, I'm not trying to get on a high horse and look down on people who use it. I have ordered many things on Amazon in my history. I try to avoid using it for books because I really believe in books and I love them and I love my city's one surviving independent bookstore. And it's terrible. If you talk to your bookstore owner, like they'll confide in you very uh, quickly, I've found, about how Amazon is this terrible knife at the throat of their business that they deal with just every day. And so uh, it's a thing that people discuss commonly in the press, where they'll have people coming in after brunch on the weekend, and they'll come through the store kind of tipsy on mimosas, and they'll look at books, and like, oh, this one's fun. Oh, I like this book. And they'll take a picture of it with their phone and go home and heartlessly order it on Amazon for a buck fifty less than they would have paid at an actual store that you can go into and hang out and enjoy your brunch buzz and pat the book 
next door cat and so on and make a friend maybe. And that's kind of a mean thing to do. I really feel like you should try to do the opposite. Let me just take one moment and mention this. The correct usage of Amazon is to use it to search for books that you've heard of that you're interested in, put them in your, in your uh, shopping cart, and then go to your local bookstore, open up your phone, open the cart, and put that on the table and go, buy me these, order me these books, and get it through your bookstore. That's the correct way to use it. You're welcome, thank you. Please sit down. The standing ovation is embarrassing me, thank you. But that's a terrible thing to do your local bookstore, you know. But if you look at Amazon history, it has the same sort of platform aspect to it. Again, it's not always immediately clear. You might say, so this network effect happens, this platform economics happen, when your use of, this, of the service makes it more useful to others. How does that apply to Amazon? If I order snacks on Amazon, how does that make it more useful to others? Well, apart from the data hoarding, much like Google and Facebook, Amazon has a mountain of data. It's very consumption focused more than Google's is, but very you know, valuable on those own terms. Amazon also, remember that more than half of its sales come from its independent or third party sellers, right? You know, when you search for something on Amazon, a book or anything else that they offer, often they'll tell you like what their Amazon price is and they'll also indicate right there on the top of the page, also available from these third party sellers, right? And frequently people will see that and go, oh, well Amazon's being open, that's positive. They don't just tell you what their price is and what they'll sell it for, like perhaps like Walmart or other semi-monopolistic retail entities. They tell you what other sellers will have it for. That's nice, what an open, competitive, market-oriented capitalist success story that is. Except of course, <laughs> that Amazon controls that marketplace, which has a number of ramifications, right? So the majority of its sales, yes, come from that marketplace, they call it Amazon Marketplace. You know, it's independent third-party sellers. Any of us can open up a little branch of our business on Marketplace. It's very user-friendly, easy to set up, and you can sell your products there. But the fact that we are all using that Amazon platform to sell our products creates a network effect, right? People are attract shoppers, people who want to buy something, are attracted to Amazon, not just because of its in-store, you know, because of its in-house selection, but because of that large body of independent sellers. If Amazon doesn't have it, someone using their platform for sales is probably going to have it. Right? Well, that creates its own network effect. As I buy things on Amazon, that attracts more third-party sellers as the market grows, and the presence of those third-party sellers, in turn, attracts more consumers. It's its own network effect. It's the, even though it's a very, again, a weirdly different, specific online commercial environment, the network effect of it is very consistent. That's the weird aspect of economics, despite the fact that the field tends to be a field good uh, puppet of the ruling class, sadly. Uh, it's, when it has insights, they really do apply across very different markets, and this is a great example of that. So Amazon, of course, is a little bit more notorious than firms like Google, not just for crushing local retail and absorbing their demand and their customer base, although they totally do do that, right? Uh, Amazon has a number of especially notorious episodes. Of course, the most famous one was its search for a second headquarters, right? The HQ2 process. And I love Seattle, I love near, living near it, I love coming here. Seattle's great, but it is a costly town, partially because of the booming success of the tech platforms based here, including Microsoft, Amazon, Oracle, and others, and also the fact that our real estate markets are driven by real estate speculators who, let's face it, are heartless, price-mongering douchebags. So we have to anticipate that. But as a result of that, in part, Amazon went on this large, extremely heavily publicized campaign that we're looking to get out of Seattle. We're looking to open a second headquarters, and we're going to bring thousands of jobs to the town that gets this headquarters and, of course, uh, bring millions of dollars in potential tax revenues to rebuild your city's crumbling roads to fight your small town's opioid epidemic in 21st century America, where small towns have been more than left behind, like actively crushed, you know. So it was very attractive to the uh, administrators and public operators of all these cities. And so we saw over the course of several months, maybe one of the most pitiful spectacles in all American history, which was the city councils and mayors of all these large, small, and medium-sized cities and, uh, and uh, municipalities in America just openly begging Amazon to choose them. And again, I mean, don't take my, my word for it. If you go on YouTube, 
which is a very useful platform you may have heard of, you'll find that a number of very funny video editors have created several hilarious clip reels of the most abject, groveling, just pitiable, like it moves your heart, pitches from these tiny no-name towns in America and Canada. God bless these people trying to bring some investment to their town. What you realize is it, sh it shouldn't come to that. It shouldn't be up to these gigantic Fortune 500 blue chip jerks like Amazon to decide which city gets to have a future. But of course, in running this thing, they attracted immeasurable publicity value to Amazon, obviously. I mean, everyone recognized what a public spectacle that was. That's obvious enough, I suppose. But also, it's a credibly visible manifestation of what we not conservative economists call that race to the bottom, when you have incredibly mobile uh, investment by companies who are free to move anywhere they want and close down operations in a city that asks for health insurance for its workers or you know, won't offer you free taxes or free real estate, go somewhere else. We call that the race to the bottom, both within the United States and around the world, after all. This is part of the reason why the US has largely lost most of its manufacturing uh, sector, which used to be the backbone of the economy for the working class who sadly now, not being offered anything else, are sometimes voting for Trump instead of Bernie Sanders, which is sad. But uh, with Amazon, it's especially fascinating because, of course, in the end, as we all know, they just completely faced the rest of the country and said, actually, we're just going to go to, Wal to uh, New York and Washington, D.C., just the two already by far most powerful and important economic and political centers in our republic, you know, New York City and DC. Those are the two great power centers of the country. And they plan to split it until figures like AOC and other uh, representatives in the state said, well, we expect to have, you know, our, our unions have access to your workforce, at least on fair terms, which was enough for Bezos to just walk away despite the bottomless groveling of New York's public se sectors, uh, sector uh, rulers from uh, Andrew Cuomo, the governor, all the way down to the somewhat better Mayor de Blasio. You know. So that's a, kind of an obvious picture of what your uh, platform power can do. But also with Amazon, it's worth mentioning something that I didn't expect when I started researching uh, this sector of the economy, but turns out to be really consistent, which is more than other sectors of the economy, I'm not exactly sure why, but something about this sector leads to its CEOs, you know, the head uh, operators of these large tech platforms. Something about this is clearly correlated with these guys being unusually tyrannical, bullying jerks to their subordinates. And so, I mean, again, don't take my word for it. If you read the, uh, the books about some of these giant firms, or even very sympathetic biographies of these CEOs, by usually business journalists, you know, people who write for the Wall Street Journal, or Business Week, or Bloomberg, Business News, these guys are very in favor of these companies because, oh, the value they're creating and the jobs, it's so wonderful. But even their journalistic ethics require them to report that, wow, if you look at what these guys, how they treat their, C, their subordinates, it's, it's like really ugly. It's like extremely ugly. So Jeff Bezos is the most notorious of these figures. And if you look at Jeff Bezos with any kind of critical eye, you very quickly realize he's sort of a you know, power-mongering, twitchy-eyed, Lex Luthor, ruling class, rectal polyp. He's kind of an especially heinous figure. But if you look at, again, the very sympathetic biographies that are written of this guy. So Brad Stone wrote The Everything Store, which is sadly to this day, like the main uh, his book on the history of Amazon. He's not antagonistic to the existence of the company or the services that it provides, but he just looks at the record that Jeff Bezos has with its subordinates, and it's at every opportunity when he's displeased, incredibly over-the-top public shaming of site developers, of executives, management figures. There's no one he's not willing to really don't take my word for it. Look at some of the words he uses to really humiliate these people for displeasing him and in front of all their colleagues at work. And remember, the key thing is lots of people are bullies in the world. People have bad childhoods and bad emotional problems. People don't mean to be obnoxious. They're just screwed up inside. You know, that would be the humanist left-wing solidarity view of these people. But if you look at these CEOs when they pick on people, it's their subordinates. You know, it's people who they have the power to friggin' fire. And so if you yell back, guess what? That's cost you your job and your health insurance, you know. 
So it's a totally different, you know, it's, you shouldn't scream and bully people, obviously. But if you're doing it to people who have power over their careers, and whether they get promoted or canned at the next uh, corporate performance review, that's a totally different beast, you know. And so Bezos is famous for this, and there's a ton of episodes of it that you can read about in the literature on this. But also, it's not just Bezos. So an example I like to turn to here, who's very similar to Bezos in his history, is Bill Gates. Right. Another local favorite of this area, Bill Gates, great Washington State, Puget Sound uh, native, God bless him, you know. But if you look at it, he, of course, built up his gigantic fortune, which is now second in the world, uh, personally, second to Jeff Bezos, of course. Uh, if you look at that fortune, people, uh, like I would say that is, when I talk to people, probably the most common um, sort of justification for these people and their wealth and the power of these tech platforms is they'll say, well, Yes, these guys may have monopolies, and maybe the public sector developed all their platform technology, fine, whatever, but they're nice guys. They have foundations. Don't you realize that, Professor Larson? They give money to AIDS resisting charities and public housing bodies. They have big foundations, you know. And it's true, the Gates Foundation is a classic example. It's the largest privately endowed foundation we have. And its gifts are very often very positive to, to activist groups and NGOs and so on. That, I mean, not all the time, but very frequently are doing very, very positive, valuable work in the world. And people will see, see, People will say, look at that, see, you realize these firms are doing good things with their monopoly money, so it's not so bad. But if you look at it, the history is interesting. I mentioned Gates because he's also notorious for being an extreme bully in the workplace, screaming at his subordinates, throwing things at them, and you dare not yell back unless you lose your job. So it's just the worst kind of cowardly bullying, bullying you can see. But if you look at Gates' foundation, which we're talking about, it's interesting. It's endowed with many billions of dollars, the large majority of which comes from donations from Gates uh, himself. And there's others like Warren Buffett have put in, and that's relevant. But looking at Gates' money, it's very interesting. If you look at the business press reporting on this, like the Wall Street Journal, New York Times business section, there's you know, very quality journalism here. And what we discover is Gates made most of the big you know, like the big nine-figure donations, the million dollar and up in the billion dollar donations to his charity during the period when Microsoft was being investigated under its antitrust trials, being investigated for being a monopolist and using it to take over other industries like web browsing and stuff. When he was using his corporate monopoly to monopolize other industries and looking like crap in the press in the 90s, that's when Gates made the large body of his donations. I mean, this is a dark thing, but I have to say it worked, you know. Even then, like the headlines go from Gates seen uh, on his, uh, Gates, uh, his, his online video deposition is contradicted by the testimony of his own software engineers about how they manipulated the Windows system to keep out competitors like Netscape's web browser in those days. Like, oh, that's an ugly headline. Then they gradually, over the 90s, get replaced by other headlines like Gates donates billion dollars to his AIDS and poverty fighting charity. Well, that sounds better. So he realizes, you look at these guys and their philanthropy, like some of that money goes to incredibly positive uh, groups and causes that you could never argue against. What you realize is, like a lot of that money is very affordable reputation laundering to these monopolists and their companies. And it becomes like, nothing will make you cynical more quickly than looking at sat some of that ugly history. You know, but it's fairly worked. I will say, you know, I talk about the, these companies and their platforms and their uh, billionaire CEOs and founders very reliably. Someone will say, yeah, but they use the money for good because I've heard of Gates Foundation and, you know, Larry Page and Jeff Bezos, you know, uh, recently put in money to fight climate change because no one else is doing it in America, so I'll do that. And it's very nice, but you know, like that's not an argument for them. I always like to use the reference to kings and emperors, you know? Like some kings in the history of European countries and other countries around the world that have royalty and kings, they'll mention like, well, you know, he's a good king because he used some of his wealth and power to help this group of poor people, to build this valuable bridge over a river to help our markets grow. And that's nice, but that doesn't justify the power of a king, you know? Maybe tomorrow he has a stroke, or his wife says something mean to him, and now he's mean. And instead of using his money to do nice things for us, he's cutting off all our heads today. Oh no, like you shouldn't have the power. Figures like Gates and Bezos and our other billionaires, from Trump to Mike Bloomberg, like do we want them to have this kind of power? 
power, whether it comes from these monopolized platforms or not, people tend to be very reasonably. I think one of the best things about America is that people have a certain uh, sort of skepticism toward powerful institutions and powerful people. And it takes a lot of billions to sort of wash that off them. But you can bring it back very quickly if you remind them of the feature of this, features of this landscape. So no matter how much of a scummy jerk you are and how badly you treat your workforce, and no matter how monopolistic your network effects powered platform monopoly is, with the commercial press who will rely on your advertisements to sustain their business model, you can get them to start saying very sweet things about you uh, if you start doing uh, nice large donations to foundations and such. I look at some of these bigger ramifications of the power of money and some of my other stuff like capitalism versus freedom, which you can look into. But it's pretty juicy, you know? And I will say the positive aspect of all this is that right now we have a lot of uh, organization going against these things in the United States these days. And some of it's extremely conspicuous, like the obvious thing would be like the Sanders campaign for Bernie Sanders, where people are, indeed, where people are putting in, you know, there's very modest amounts of money that are meaningful to them. You know, the $27 is the famous average donation there. But because of the huge base of support and because of the popularity of Sanders policies, you know, from Medicare for All to the Green New Deal to breaking up or maybe nationalizing like utilities some of these firms, like those policies have real appeal. And indeed, figures like Elizabeth Warren have sort of somewhat similar uh, platforms on tech uh, monopolies. Those figures get a large amount of small donor support like you and me. Uh, that sort of speaks to the fact that Americans recognize that a lot of what happens in the world comes from remote, uncaring bastards who control the society and don't really care about what happens to us. People see it and people are caring more and more. And indeed with the tech platforms themselves, what we see is there's a kind of a surprising to me, a real wave of activism uh, striking back against these companies and Google in particular, which again, I always like to use as an example because of their beautiful reputation and their free services and how incredibly useful they are. I found my way here tonight using Google Maps. Once again, let me say, I rely on these companies' products constantly. But the power they get from them, people can see that. And so Google's had a number of walkouts from its own very select, very trained professional staff because they realize it's using software to develop AI for drones so the Pentagon can blow up penniless people in Yemen more easily. Or because it turns out that they paid off one of the Android mobile operating system developers uh, who left the firm because of sexual harassment charges and they give him a multi-million dollar golden parachute. That's ugly and the workers are rising up about that right now or beginning to organize and deal with that. And so we have entities like the Tech Worker Coalition through the communications workers who are trying to deal with that. I'm very happy to see those uh, processes making some kind of steps. So just remember, like it's not a, hope, a hopeless era right now. I will say if you're on the left at all and you're critical of the power and wealth of these companies, you probably know how long giant companies have been dominant in America and many of us perhaps you know, gave up hope that we would see something really challenge them. And we, you know, have st stalwart figures like Chomsky who give us guidance through this, but we don't expect any big changes. People give up on that. This is a time when we're really seeing some potential change, you know. This younger generation, I'm teaching them, let me tell you, I don't have to push them to the left. It's, it happens when they come in the door, you know. So this is a time when we can expect some kind of positive change. You shouldn't be feeling hopeless in the face of how powerful these firms are just because they have all your data and know everything about you and everywhere you go and everything you look at online, including that really embarrassing thing you thought of just now when I said that. They, like, there are rising up forces at this time that you can participate in. Like, this is a time to get into it and put some money in if you can and put some time in, especially that's the way to move forward, you know. So I will say uh, it's, it's not a totally bleak era, and I think if we work together, we can see some real changes uh, in this uh, online platform economy, regardless of what, specifically what happens in this November. Social struggle is a long process, and I think if we work together, we can really move uh, some of those processes around. So anyway, thank you for listening to that. Hi, um, I, I'm, my name is Aram, I work in tech and telecom specifically, so I was a little confused by one thing you say, maybe it's a little geeking out here, but you, I can see how Amazon, Google, et cetera, are different from Standard Oil, but the whole concept of network effect, from what I understand, came from AT&T. Hmm. So you kind of said, 
Sandra Doyle and AT&T is over here and all these tech stories. I mean, AT&T created the network effect, right? Or did I misunderstand you? Oh, no, that's absolutely right. I might have misspoken there, but you're correct. Yeah, like the most classic case to see the network effect is exactly what you said, right, AT&T. Like in the early days of that company, of course, you know, back in the early days of having telephones, this will be crazy to the younger people listening, but there was a time when you had not your phone, but the phone, like in your house. You had a phone attached to a physical wall using bad copper wires from 80 years ago to connect to people. And that's exactly right. AT&T, of course, American Telephone and Telegraph, right, had a phone service monopoly, not an oligopoly, a monopoly for most of the 20th century, right, until the government broke it up in 82, I believe it was, 84. Sounds good. You're the expert on this. And it's very interesting, you know, you did have in the early days like independent phone operators, but because they used different technological systems, like they weren't technically compatible. So there's a strong, like legitimate efficiency need to have a single standard for those phone systems to operate on. And very commonly, that's how network effects lead to monopoly, is people are looking for a single standard. That's how Microsoft gained its uh, monopoly on PC operating systems. It wasn't because Windows is so great. That definitely is not the case. It's because web developers want the biggest audience, and that was with Windows, because they had the IBM contract. But AT&T is absolutely a classic case. These network effects, their original manifestation was not tech platforms. It was telecommunications itself and telecom. And of course, you don't have more classic telecom than AT&T. So that's absolutely right, man. You're completely up uh, the right alley there. Just one quick thing, I'll dating myself here, because I remember when I came to this country for college, and a friend of mine had a little modem, if you took your phone and you stuck it into it, I later learned that back then you were not allowed to sell or buy a modem. You had to rent it from the company because yeah. they said it's our network, so you can't attach, plug anything into it. Yeah. So that's like even older than, oh, remember this phone in the wall. I remember the phone in the wall where it belonged to the company. Yeah, that's actually a really great point. You know, in economics, we have this idea called rents. And normally, rent means the bill you have to pay to your landlord that you can't afford to live in Seattle. But rents in economics means where you have a monopoly and you use that to pull income out of other people who can't do anything else. And that's maybe the most classic case. Yeah, for most of the year of its monopoly, AT&T forbade its users from modifying its equipment and all. And indeed, they usually owned the physical equipment itself, like your physical phone, like the handset that you talk talking to with your face would be AT&T's property. And you hear stories where people would fiddle with it slightly or retrofit it with some modification to change the audio or muffle the speaking voice or something. And they would get in trouble with AT&T. They would try to make them take it off their phone or sue you if you try to sell it. So it's a classic case of what they call rentier power. Yeah, with telecom uh, monopoly. It's uh, one of the many, many juicy cases we have of companies using their monopoly to not do nice things. Even though their ads are so nice on TV, they seem so friendly, and yet they use their power against us. What can we do? But yeah, it's a great example, man. Thanks.